Oh, sorry. Lightly distracting for me, but okay. I'm thinking like, it might, I don't know if we need to do it that way or when somebody stops reading Diego, if you can just like put your cursor up to where they stopped at that okay. moment. So that way you don't have to- Got it, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? That was just my, my thought. How are you feeling, Jen? Oh my gosh, so much better today. So sorry you went through that. That's the worst. It's just so frustrating because you just, there's nothing you can do. There's literally- Oh, nothing. Jen, what happened? Did I miss something? Oh no, I just have, I've been, this year I've been suffering from like visual migraines. So like I was oh, no. typing a, a letter, an email Whoa. yesterday, and all of a sudden, like I couldn't see the letters. Like I just, for the life of me, and I tried, I kept like trying to like look out the side and I was, I was getting all sorts of typos and I was like, okay, I have to stop. And, um, and then I end up getting this like peripheral, like, like visual squiggy lines and it, that oh, lasted a couple of hours. And then after that goes away, then I get punched with like the migraine. That's so, nasty. Yeah, but I'm here and it's gone. <laughs> hey Jen, can you stick the uh, Ouroboros in the chat bar? Cause I'm yep. in a different place. And so now I have to do the whole. <laughs> I'll do it right now. And so I just had a quick question. So I am not going to hang up the embroidery behind me. I'll just show it because um, I have the background. Here we go. Why don't you just take the background down? And then when, after you show it, you can put it back up again. I can do that. I think that's the easiest. Okay. That would be my suggestion. So you're not like negotiating with the <laughs> yeah let me call, let me hide the magic of my computer <laughs> the magic oro boro here we come <laughs> that would be such a great name for a dog <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> how come it's not letting me download the image and it's got a big exclamation point by it oh that's weird i'll email it to you, you did that to me last time too yeah for some reason zoom is like not letting certain file sizes or something i don't even know i don't think it's that big of a file but i know that's why it's on. confusing yeah okay it just sent it so it should be oh, oh, it that pretty little sound i heard <laughs> Can you believe we live in a world where this is normal to us? I know. Remember the good old days where you had to mail things to people? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Wait, baby. how come I can't find it? Let's see. I, I think I called, I titled it image in the subject line. Got it. Okay, good. Download. Work as a JPEG on my desktop. <laughs> turn that off, turn that off. Go to Zoom and load, lift it higher. Go away. Oh, I here's another question I have. How do we feel about this the music that accompanies the embroidery time lapse? Or should I just try to mute it? I think it's kind of cute. Okay. Yeah, it's so cheesy. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I just made that up on my own. I'm not getting the option for how to do my screen. Why is that? Under video settings, it doesn't let you add one. Oh, I see. Got it. It changed okay. location on this new computer. Computer. Okay. Add. Add image. Desktop. I knew I should have named it something more obvious. Dot O four symmetry and spirals is like hard to find. Diego, how do you say the name of that creature one more time? Oro. I say it as Ouroboros, but Ouroboros. some people say it as Ouroboros. Okay. I don't know which one it's supposed to be. Who are you calling an Ouroboros? 
personally, personally, I like Aurora. Yeah, when you talked about faster. sloth the other night, she was like in the chat, who that are you funny. calling a sloth? Did that make sense at all? Or was I just <laughs> going on some random tangent? I feel like no, I everything, I you know, the beautiful thing about you, Diego, is pretty much anything you say makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. You have this like ability to make sense out of things that. Oh, uh, you all have that too. That's how I feel. And also, like very complicated subject matter too. Yeah, you do a great job. Thank you. And that, that's just like um, our uh, that video I posted today of um, of. Uh, uh, Lynn Margulis, she can talk about such complicated things like they were so obvious, like, oh yeah, well, I didn't really think of that, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> she was so casual. Yeah. Casual, but feisty. The thing I remember learning about her is that she was like a feisty female scientist and all the male scientists were like, oh no, your symbiogenesis isn't, that's not right. That's not how evolution works. And she was like, uh-uh. And she was like, she was going. Yeah, I bet to get to her position, she had to have waited through so much. She really did. Newton always says she should have gotten a Nobel Prize for her work and that she was denied because she was a woman wow. of, of that honor. Um, I really got so much out of that video about, um, Sim symbiogenesis and yeah, I have to watch it. I saw it in the chat, but I haven't gotten a chance to see it. And its relationship to novelty in ecosystems, which is I guess an appropriation by Newton in many ways. Oh, um, but, um, but <laughs> it's so interesting to uncover like what I thought was Newton's ideas and because <laughs> that's good. It's appropriation is is the joining together it's like the mitochondria the it's the symbiogenesis <laughs> that's why my my poet friend vanessa she wrote some art history about a polish artist that i cut and pasted into my instagram about what my own work was my latest oh, thing i was yeah. just, oh i'm just taking vanessa's writing oh and, really was it the one about like indirect relation yeah. yes i was like lauren <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and, 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 and I was like, oh, Vanessa, by the way, I just lift because she she copies a, like artist text and that's what she does. So I yeah. figure it's an open field with her. So absolutely. Oh, do you have do you have an Instagram? I should. Yeah. Metabolic video. There's I was off of Instagram for a long time, but then I made another one to post my artwork on it. So there's oh. Metabolic oh. Studio, but then there's also mine, which is Lauren metropolis i think okay <laughs> all right it's show time okay let's do Ow. it Ow. Ow. <laughs> instead of leading tonight we are going to howl <laughs> I think we're all coming in. Yep, yep. yep. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Metabolic Studios Learning and Mending series, which is now in its fifth iteration. In this series, from micro to macro, we will be exploring implications of integrated forms of systems thinking that allows us to think across scales from particle, cell, brain, society ecosystem to cosmic matter. From micro to macro, we'll build upon what we learned about from Anna Singh's disturbance ecology and have an emphasis on complexity, networks, and patterns of organization. Many of you have received embroidery kits from us of native plants, birds, and microscopic organisms that Metabolic Studio is currently cultivating on its project sites. Taken as a collection, all of these embroideries will collectively illustrate biogeochoanosis, which describes the intimate association between living things and physical environment. If you've not received an embroidery kit or would like to receive another one, please send your name and mailing address to info at metabolicstudio.org. Tonight, we will share our screen and we encourage you to read a section of the text aloud with us. When there is a pause in the reading, 
Please feel free to unmute yourself and begin where the last person left off. Silence is golden, and there is no pressure to fill the transitional spaces while we enjoy a breath and continue crafting. Feel free to jump in and continue reading at your own comfort level. You don't have to read, it's also fine to enjoy listening. So it looks like we are all here, so I will now introduce this week's um, Embroider of the Week. And I'm sharing this week's Embroider of the Week. Um, it's another bird, and the one the reasons why I chose this one this week is because we showed a bird last week, and this is completely different take on how to um, embroider the bird. And I just thought it was so beautiful and equally delicate as last week's. This one actually was also completed by Cindy. Woo! She has been embroidering like crazy. I, I know that you're working on a new one actually too tonight. Um, Cindy, do you have any um, comments you'd like to share? I, I would like to say before you, you jump in, I just, want to say how much I love the red veins in the leaf pattern that you did. The, the bird, honestly, it was kind of scary to do because it's an actual image of a of an object and I didn't know how to make it. So I was really, it was really hard for me to get started on the bird. I did the leaves because I've done leaves in the past and I did the branch because it's a manzanita branch. So they're kind of red or burgundy-ish, so that's where that mm -hmm. color palette came in. But the bird, the leaves and the stem, that was easy. The bird was hard, but <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy with how it turned out. It's beautiful. And I'm, I do I have it. a new I one. Really I have an underground pattern working now. We'll see how that comes out. Thank you. Thank you. And now I will pass it to Kelly and she will introduce the reading and the guiding question for tonight. Great, thanks Jen. Yay, Cindy. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so tonight, welcome everyone. Tonight we're gonna go dive further into our systems thinking theme. Um, and what we're doing tonight is kind of interesting. Lauren and I were thinking of it as kind of a, a diptych reading session. And so we decided to have these great backgrounds, which are the diptych artwork for this series, because the two readings that we have tonight um, on first encounter seem like they're very different um, topic areas. Um, and we did notice that there are some overlaps in terms of themes of like emergence and creativity. Um, but we also just accepted that we didn't have to force them into the same thematic and that reading two uh, uh, different uh, topic areas back to back might emerge new interesting insights. And so it's like letting that be, you know. Um, so we just thought of it that way. And um, tonight is further reading with the Fritoff Capra's A System View of Life. Um, and the first reading we'll do, it really dives into the biophysical kind of uh, creativity of living structures, um, looking at it really through the lens of mathematics and chemistry, and we'll get into chirality. And Diego even made a great uh, diagram that we're excited about, uh, has a dinosaur just as a little uh, teaser, so just be excited for that. Um, and then, <laughs> um, the second reading will will take a look at the emergence of human consciousness and the, um, its its links to our evolutionary past. This reading is um, definitely through a Darwinian and neo Darwinian lens, which I'll be interested to discuss with you guys afterwards because there are other other ways of thinking about evolution and and the way consciousness has developed over time. Um, so those are the two diptych readings and our guiding questions tonight um, starts with reading one, uh, a question, why is chirality or the property of asymmetry, which is what chirality is, I've come to learn, um, considered to be in, an important concept in many branches of science? And what examples of chirality can you think of in nature? Uh, E.g., you know, human hands are considered chiral, for instance. So they're asymmetrical. They can't act. They can't be mirrored on top of each other. 
And apparently that's very common in the natural world. Um, and then the second question is, do you, and this question is meant to be a little provocative for discussion purposes, but do you think human beings are genetically hardwired towards violence? And how much do you think violence, and I added exploitation because I think they're very related um, tendencies, are genetically determined versus culturally conditioned? So genetic determined versus cultural conditioned, that classic challenging question. And I will put these in the chat now, and I'll also put them in uh, when we start our discussion so they're easy for you guys to reference while we talk. And now I will send it back over to Jen for our time lapse. Thank you, Kelly. Um, tonight we will be featuring a quick time lapse, uh, at, which also demonstrates an embroidery stitch that's really interesting. Um, and it, if you pay attention, it's not the first one, um, which I think they said it was the back stitch. This uh, this is a, more of a spiral where you twist the thread. 15 times along the needle and then pull it back down. It's kind of an interesting spiral. So I will start that. Let's see. Okay, can everybody see? Okay. expect all of you to uh, put this stitch into your embroideries. I will be looking for them as the <laughs> submissions come back in. Extra points if you actually do the stitches that are in the videos. <laughs> and so now uh, we can start our readings. Nature spirals. Is that where we're starting? Yeah. Um, the Fibonacci sequence and the golden section are closely associated with logarithmic spirals, which, as we've noted, are ubiquitous in the living world. The logarithmic spiral has several unique properties that help us understand why it appears so frequently in nature. It is defined mathematically as a curve that is magnified by the same factor known as its growth rate in successive turns through a constant angle around its origin or pole. In other words, the spiral's radius, a straight line between the pole and the point on the curve, increases in geometric progression with each turn. Different growth rates will produce different geometric progressions and hence different logarithmic spirals. The golden spiral is a particular logarithmic spiral that grows by a factor of this, the golden ratio for every quarter turn. As a consequence of this special geometry, the logarithmic spiral has the unique property known as self similarity. It does not alter its shape as its size increases. As the astrophysicist Mario Livio points out, this is precisely the property required for many growth phenomena in nature. For example, the mollusk inside the nautilus shell grows in fixed proportions and so does his home in successive chambers of the shell. By the way, 
the growth rate of the nautilus shell is different from that of the golden spiral, meaning that there is no significant relationship between the nautilus and the golden ratio, as is sometimes stated erroneously. We've already mentioned the striking growth pattern of sunflower seeds, which features two sets of interpenetrating spirals, one running clockwise and the other counterclockwise. Typically, the number of spirals in each set turns out to be two consecutive Fibonacci numbers. This means that the golden angle is the generative principle of this pattern, just as it is in the helical phylotaxis. In 1979, the biophysicist Helmut Vogel created a mathematical model representing the growth patterns of the corresponding primordia and was able to show that only the golden angle produces a tight packing of the seed heads. Even a slight change in the angle causes the pattern to break into a single family of spirals with gaps between the seeds. The artists of the Renaissance were fascinated not only by the golden section, but also by the logarithmic spiral. For Leonardo da Vinci, the spiral form was the archetypical code for the ever-changing and yet stable nature of living forms. He saw it in the growth patterns of plants and animals, in curling locks, and above all, in the swirling vortices of water and air. Leonardo accurately depicted these spiral patterns in countless drawings. And his fascination with spiral movements can also be seen in many of his paintings, especially with his, in, his, in the portraits. Leonardo created the form of the serpentine figure that became one of the fundamental forms of classical elegance. In his Lady with an Ermine, for example, the model turns her face by 90 degrees to look over her shoulder in the direction of the light that is illuminating her. As the art historian Daniel Arase observed, the pose is particularly ingenious in that in spite of being twisted, the figure remains supple. This impression of suppleness is further emphasized by the curving movement of the necklace, and most of all, by the movement of the animal. As arranged by Leonardo, the two figures participate in the same spiraling curve that is finally divided by the direction of their gazes. Okay, I'll take up. Um, chirality and symmetry breaking. The emergence of the Fibonacci sequence in phylotaxis and, and of the properties associated with it can be traced back to specific dynamics of symmetry breaking in the growth patterns of the primordia, which are the first clumps of cells at the tip of the plant's tiny shoot. However, a corresponding explanation of asymmetry embodied in the logarithmic spirals that are so widespread in nature has not yet been found. While the nautilus shell is symmetric, the section shown in figure eight 9.19 is one of two halves coiling in opposite directions. The shells of most snails in nature are coiled either to the right or to the left, depending on the species. 
with the great majority of species bearing right-handed shells. The search for an explanation of this apparently intrinsic asymmetry of nature is a subject of intense investigation. As mentioned earlier, the key question is whether homo chirality in nature is due to chance or whether there is a basic physical principle that demands the preference for one type of enantiomer, enantiomer over the other. There have been several attempts to develop theoretical models of chiral symmetry, breaking at the molecular level. However, the required calculations are not easy because the very slight, almost negligible energy difference between the two enantiomers. Consequently, most chemists and biologists in the field remain skeptical about these models. However, there is an interesting chemical observation that may bring support to the idea that the origin of chirality may be due to some fundamental principle in certain meteorites, some derivatives of A amino acids, called A methyl amino acids, have been found to have a higher proportion of the L form over the D form. This may be consistent with the idea that particular conditions in outer space may favor one form over the other, thereby inducing a breaking of the symmetry. It is, of course, not possible to assess whether these chiral compounds and meteorites were the seeds for homo chirality of life on Earth. <clears throat> One reason why many chemists and biologists are skeptical about these and other subtle physical effects is that the breaking of symmetry can be realized rather simply in a chemistry laboratory. This has been shown by Mir Lav one of the leading researchers in the field, working with crystals as agents of symmetry breaking. Similar experience, experiments were performed by Kondipudi Con and collaborators who were able to show that starting from a mixture of a compound that, a, that can crystallize into two chiral forms chance effects induce the selective crystallization of only one of the two forms. The argument is that these kinds of effects might have happened on the early earth and would have produced an asymmetric template on which the first chemical reactions started, thus giving the molecular imprint of chirality. In other words, the L and D forms had the same probability of occurring, but it just so happened that because of some accidental conditions, life started with the L form. Concluding remarks. The synergy between self-organization and emergence shapes and determines the structures and functions of life's molecular complexes. And as we shall see in chapter 14, it is also of crucial importance in social life. In static systems, self-organization and the resulting emergent properties are relatively simple concepts well explained by chemistry and physics, but in dynamic systems, the process of self-organization and emergence are subtle and complex, and their outcomes are often unforeseeable, both in biological and in social life. In a way, this carries a positive message. New structures, technologies, and new forms of social organization may arise quite unexpectedly in situations of instability, chaos, or crisis. The system's view of life is essential for understanding these phenomena. Instead of being a machine, nature at large turns out to be more like human nature, unpredictable, sensitive to the surrounding world, and influenced by small fluctuations. Accordingly, 
the appropriate way of approaching nature to learn about her complexity and beauty is not through domination and control, but through respect, cooperation, and dialogue. Indeed, Ilia Prigiogine and Isabel Stengers, 1984, gave their popular book, Order Out of Chaos, the, subtle, the subtitle, Man's New Dialogue with Nature. In the deterministic world of Newton, there is no history and no creativity. In the living world of self-organizing and emergent structures, history plays an important role. The future is uncertain, and this uncertainty is at the heart of creativity. Thus, Prigiogine, 1989, one of the architects of this new scientific perspective, reflected in a beautiful essay titled The Philosophy of Instability. Today, the world we see outside and the world we see within are converging. This convergence of two worlds is perhaps one of the important cultural events of our age. Another important point about emergence is that life itself can be seen as an emergent property, a consideration that gives the notion of emergence a particularly poignant significance. No vitalistic principle, no transcendent force is invoked to arrive at life. As we have mentioned already, this has two consequences. One, cellular life, at least in principle, can be explained in terms of molecular components and their complex nonlinear interactions. Two, it becomes conceivable to make some simple forms of life in the laboratory. Life, as we have seen again and again, is one of those phenomena that cannot be explained in reductionistic terms. One could never grasp the essence of a rose by saying that it is composed of atoms and molecules. An emergentist approach to understanding the essence of the rose would be to <coughs> consider its ontogeny, development, pausing at each level of growing complexity in order to study the corresponding emergent properties from the formation of the various flower cells to the interactions between all these cells and up to the characteristics of the complex organs such as petal and stem, including odor and color. We would then consider the rose as the final flowering of all these emergent properties. The notion that one arrives at in the end is that the rose is an ensemble of various emergent properties, the colors, the perfume, the symmetry, without any central localization where the essence of the rose would be condensed. We have already encountered this concept of an ensemble with non-localized global properties when asking the question, what is life? And we shall encounter it again when we discuss the nature of mind and consciousness in chapter 12. Indeed, many cognitive scientists today would agree that the very notion of I is an emergent property arising from the simultaneous occurrence and resonance of feelings, memories, and thoughts, so that the I is not localized anywhere, but rather is an organized pattern without a center. In the words of one of the pioneers in this field, Francisco Varela, 1999, this is one of the key ideas and a stroke of genius in today's cognitive science. There are the different components that combine and together produce a transient, non-localizable, relationally formed self, which nevertheless manifests itself as a perceivable entity. We will never discover a neuron, a soul, or some core essence that constitutes the emergent self of Francisco Varela or some other person.
I think that might be where it ends, Diego. Is there another page? I don't think so. No, there's not another page. Okay. So that's the first reading in, in total. So now we're ready for your chiral imagery. Okay, so I made this little set of diagrams to um, kind of help convey what chirality is. Um, first of all, the, the word, and I just took this straight from Wikipedia, but the word chirality is derived from this Greek root word that just means hand. And it's a reference to the right-handed and left-handed um, symmetry that you see in chiral systems. But I included this dinosaur here because it's called dinochirus. Um, and it comes from the same root word as chirality. And it's because for the, for the longest time, the only fossils anyone had of this dinosaur were its hands. So that's what they named it after. Anyway, um, what I have up here is um, a system where you have a, a plane of symmetry, this line in the middle. And on both sides of this plane of symmetry, you see that um, if you were to take this side, this yellow side, and superimpose it over on the blue side, you would be able to do it to where they would coincide with one another completely. But um, a chiral system, as you see down here with the example of bird wings, just like human hands, um, if you were to take these two mirror images and superimpose them onto one another, they can't be, uh, they won't fit completely. So they'll only overlap in this kind of way um, that you see down here. So this is the difference between what's a chiral system down here with the wings and an achiral system, which is the boxes up here. Um, the word that we encountered during the reading was um, enantiomers, which is uh, uh, when you're talking about molecules, that's what it's called. But basically um, these two different sides, these two mirror images are called enantiomorphs. Um, so, whether it's molecules or hands or wings or any number of other things, um, you see that there are two sides of the, of the symmetry. So that's what the individual uh, images are called is, is enantiomorphs. Um, the reading also touched on something called homochirality. And as I understand that, um, I don't have an illustration of it here, but it's like in the case of a snail shell, you have um, a coiling spiral that's going only in one direction. So if you think of the snail as just being, as pointing forward on the right side of the snail, the shell might coil and go off in that direction or on the left side of the snail, the shell might coil and go off in, the, in that direction. But there's not um, both of the enantiomorphs like you might see with the bird wing or the hands. It's just that it's going on one side. Um, and if you were to find a mirror image of it, then they wouldn't be superimposable. So that's what I have for chirality. Hopefully that makes it um, somewhat clear for people. And we can move on to the next reading then. Yes, thank you for that. I loved your little diagram. It actually helped a lot. So thanks. thanks. With this one, we'll start at 11.3, the determinants of being human. The determinants of being human. During most of Western philosophy, human nature was believed to be unique and radically different from the nature of animals. Aristotle taught that the human soul shared certain characteristics with the animal soul, but that its principal and unique characteristic was reason. 
Christian medieval philosophers associated this faculty with the soul's divine origin, and they believed that it was uniquely human and immortal. And finally, Descartes uh, postulated that the fundamental division between mind and matter, which implied an even more radical difference between humans inhabited by a rational soul and animals who were simply machines. Charles Darwin challenged not only the traditional idea of the fixed nature of species, but also the assumption of human uniqueness. In The Descent of Man, Darwin argued that our power of abstract thought was rooted in the cognitive abilities of our ape-like ancestors. And he suggested that similar cognitive skills, including the use of tools, would be found in chimpanzees and other modern apes. Contemporary studies in primatology have completely confirmed Darwin's revolutionary view. Today, we know that the genomes of chimpanzees and humans differ by a mere 1.6%. As the primatologist Robert Fouts explains, our skeleton is an upright version of the chimpanzee skeleton. Our brain is an enlarged version of the chimpanzee brain. Our vocal tract is an innovation on the chimpanzee vocal tract. In addition, it is well known that much of the chimpanzee facial repertoire is similar to our own. The continuity between humans and chimpanzees does not end with anatomy, but also extends to social and cultural characteristics. Like us, chimpanzees are social creatures. In, cap in captivity, they suffer most from loneliness and boredom. In the wild, they thrive on change, foraging in different fruit trees every day, building different sleeping nests every night, and socializing with various members of their community as they travel through the jungle. In addition, chimpanzees nurture family bonds, mourn the death of mothers and adopt orphans, struggle for power and wage war. In short, there seems to be as much social and cultural continuity in the evolution of humans and chimpanzees as there is anatomical continuity. Moreover, communication studies with chimpanzees, in particular with the help of sign language, had, have confirmed that the cognitive and emotional lives of animals and humans differ only by degree. That life is a great continuum in which differences between species are gradual and evolutionary. Cognitive scientists have fully confirmed this evolutionary conception of human nature. In the words of the cognitive linguists, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, reason, even in its most abstract form, makes use of rather than transcends our animal nature. Reason is thus not an essence that separates us from other animals, rather it places us on a continuum with them. In view of the fact that our human genome is the result of a long historical pathway through which we are related, not only to our ape cousins, but ultimately to all living species, it is interesting to ask ourselves to what extent some of our outstanding human characteristics are genetically based, resulting from our animal instincts, and to what extent have they been acquired culturally? Ape, the killing ape instinct. One of the first questions that comes to mind concerns the aggressive nature of humans. As witnessed by thousands of years of bloody wars and killing, is this the result of a genetic trait? Are we genetically determined to be aggressive, to make war and kill each other as a kind of genetic damnation of our being human? This question is made reasonable by the observation that many other animal species do not behave in such a way. 
They may kill each other to defend territory or their mates, but they do not band together in ferocious raiding groups for premeditated pre acts, attacks on other groups of animals of the same species. There's also no doubt that the human species is the most belligerent and cruel of all species. It is an interesting book, Demonic males, the anthropologist Rangham and Peterson studying the aggressive behaviors of apes and humans arrive at a grim conclusion. Only humans and chimpanzees are killing apes with the habit or at least the capability of organizing themselves in male bonding teams with the aim of killing in a cold blooded way, other individuals of the same species. Humans and chimpanzees diverged from each other only 5 million years ago, while the gorillas branched out 10 million years ago. However, many, however, very interestingly, two to three million years later, another kind of ape branched off from the chimpanzee, the bonobo, a kind of smaller chimpanzee, previously called pygmy chimp, and correctly termed pan paniscus. The amazing thing is that the bonobos are not aggressive at all. They are the friendliest and most peaceful of all animals. As we have mentioned, the bonobo branched off the chimpanzee about 3 million years ago. And it is hypothesized that this diversification was due to the fact that some families of chimpanzees had to live in a different, more hospitable environment an environment difference that may eventually have caused a drastic change in genetic behavior. Might this kind of branching off happen again with the arising of a novel human species similar to the bonobos rather than to the chimpanzees? For the, first, for the time being, we have to accept the observations of the two already mentioned anthropologists, Rangham and Peterson, who reject the notion that there are on our planet, peaceful, idyllic places without violence, expressing this view thus. Neither in history nor around the globe today is there evidence of a truly peaceful society. But the suggestion that chimpanzees and humans have similar patterns of violence rests on more than the claims of universal human violence. It depends on something more specific. The idea that men in particular are systematically violent, violent by temperament. In other words, violence is not a general human characteristic, but rather a specifically male human characteristic. We also need to take into account the secondary effects of human aggression. For example, the bloody bullfights and the barbarous practice of hunting and killing innocent animals for pleasure. Or think of competitive sports, which in a way can be seen as a sublimation of human aggression, but occasionally take the form of fierce animosity and violence. Another category that comes to mind is the field of economics and business. Are not the recent forms of colonialism, including missionary colonialism, and the present predatory capitalism expression of this human of this human aggressiveness. As we shall discuss in chapter 17, our world today is dominated by a global economic system with disastrous social and environmental impacts. A tragic consequence of this form of violence is the fact that we are the only species on earth who destroys its own habitat threatening countless other species with extinction in the process. To this determinant of aggressiveness, we also need to attribute negative emotions such as anger, hate, and jealousy. The whole issue of emotions has recently become an important topic of research in cognitive science, as we shall discuss in the following chapter. Fortunately, killing and aggression are not the only determinant of our being human. There is also the opposite trait of love and altruism in which we now turn.
love and altruism. Love is certainly a very fundamental aspect of animal behavior. Obviously, love of the mother for her offspring can, can be seen as an instinct and is in the main device provided by nature for the preservation of species. And love and sexual attraction between males and females can also be seen in this light as the best way to ensure reproduction. In humans, love can also be seen as instinct, but it comes together with consciousness and moral codes. To say that love is genetically determined is not to negate or diminish the beauty of love in all of its many wonderful manifestations, nor to diminish the cultural and artistic aspects brought about in our civilization by our con conception of love. And the same is true for altruism. There is a vast literature on altruism and cooperation within the Darwin, Darwinian scientific community, dealing with symbiosis and many other technical aspects upon which we cannot dwell here. Suffice it to say that altruism, cooperation, and love can be linked to natural selection. Groups, tribes, and social structures that were characterized by altruism and cooperation had better chances of survival. This is, certainly, this is certainly an important aspect of being human. To the qualities of love and altruism, we should add positive emotions like empathy, joy, happiness, gratitude, euphoria, and hope, as well as positive feelings such as feeling satisfied, sympathetic, and fulfilled. This is nowadays an important field of neurobiological inquiry. The two determinants of being human discussed so far, the killing ape instinct and love and altruism are both linked inextricably to human consciousness, which is our next determinant. Consciousness and Spirituality. As we briefly indicated in chapter seven, in connection with our discussion of autopoiesis, the cognitive dimension is an integral part of the systemic conception of life. During the past three decades, the study of mind and consciousness from this systemic perspective has grown into a richly interdisciplinary field of study known as cognitive science, which we shall discuss in detail in the following chapter. Here, we want to limit ourselves to just a few comments regarding consciousness and spirituality as determinants of being human, leaving a deeper exploration of their nature and origin for later. We have seen in the previous section that the paintings and artifacts found in Paleolithic caves strongly indicate that the Cro-Magnons express their sense of belonging in religious rituals. There is also evidence of burial ceremonies indicating that these early humans were thinking about their own death but this evidence is only about 25,000 years old and is thus relatively recent history. The question is whether the early hominids had a consciousness of being. Was Lucy, over three million years ago, mentally aware of her own existence? And was this awareness, if present, connected to an evolutionary advantage? This is a difficult question which has no clear-cut answer. One consideration that comes to mind is that a sense of awe and wonder may have arisen as soon as our hominid ancestors began to stand up and walk on two legs. Once they could walk erect and look up, they would have faced more directly the mysteries of nature, lightning and stormy weather, the starry night sky, the phases of the moon, the sunrise, and so on. And at the same time, this kind of spiritual perception may have induced a sense of self. In other words, the beginning of spirituality may well be attended by the consciousness of being. The idea that some supernatural powers might be responsible for these phenomena must have arisen then, at the very beginning of human perception, and may well have been accompanied by the development of some religious rituals. It can also be argued that ritual, rituals of this sort may have had an impact on natural selection, since the groups or tribes who were involved in them would have had greater internal cohesion and strength, which would have helped their survival. In this regard, one should mention one line of research in Darwinian evolution. Some authors have expressed the idea that humans are genetically characterized by being born to believe, at this point, it is proper to refer to one other modern author, albeit not the most uncontroversial, Mark Hauser. He argues that morality, which can be seen as a basic aspect of spirituality, is grounded in biology. According to him, there is an innate 
universal moral grammar that belongs to the human species as a product of evolution, while the specific expression of this morality varies among different places, depending on the contingent constraints. This would imply that for humans, the moral code comes from within human nature without any need for religion. Curiosity and the thirst for knowledge. Our list of the genetic determinants of being human would not be complete if we did not add another very beautiful trait of humanity, the desire for knowledge, the search for understanding the nature around us, and the desire to conquer the difficulties presented to us by nature. We have mentioned the awe and wonder of our ancestor hominids facing the mysteries of nature, sunrise and sunset, the phases of the moon, the colors of flowers, and the birth and growth of animals and plants. What they must have felt right from the beginning was not only awe and wonder, but also curiosity and a desire to understand. And with that also the desire to master the environment with the help of tools, which became more and more sophisticated with time. It is commonly accepted that this development was triggered by rapid brain growth at the dawn of human evolution, about 4 million years ago, when language, reflective consciousness, the ability to make and use tools, and organized social relations all evolved together. The size of the brain has been an important determinant for human development, since brain size is widely believed to be proportional to intelligence. The hominid brain has nearly quadrupled in size over the past 4 million years from the chimpanzee, 400 cubic centimeters, to Australopithecus, 600 cubic centimeters, to Homo erectus, 1200 cubic centimeters, to modern humans, 1400 cubic centimeters. However, the relation between brain size and intelligence is not straightforward. Intelligence as such, the capability of solving problems, is not necessarily hereditary. It can be retained indefinitely by an individual, but cannot be genetically transmitted to descendants. Moreover, when we look at a possible direct relation between brain size and intelligence, it appears that human intelligence is not necessarily adaptive in an evolutionary sense. Indeed, large-headed babies are more difficult to give birth to, and large brains are costly in terms of nutrient and oxygen requirements. But the fact that the direct adaptive benefit of human intelligence may appear questionable makes it even clearer that cleverer humans may gain indirect selective benefits. The relation between intelligence, thinking, and mind is a complex one, which we shall explore in our next chapter. For the purpose of this section, let us simply add human intelligence as a determinant that led to the rise of science, the desire to shed light on the darkness of ignorance and of technology, the desire to apply this knowledge practically these applications range from the invention of the alphabet and the wheel to all forms of modern technology, including the invention of gunpowder, bombs, and other warfare devices that are linked to our first genetic determinant, the killer ape instinct. The search for beauty and harmony. Let us now consider the search for beauty and harmony and the corresponding artistic creativity. A world without Greek statues, Chinese brush paintings, Indian chola bronzes, or Renaissance frescoes without the music of Mozart, Beethoven, or Bach would not be our world. As we have seen, the artistic expressions of human consciousness began with magnificent paintings in Paleolithic caves 30,000 years ago. At the very birth of the modern human species, see figure 11.1, from roughly the same era date 
the famous Paleolithic Venus figures, often interpreted as fertility symbols, as well as musical instruments such as flutes. Why do we create these monuments to beauty and harmony? Is this too connected with the genes, meaning that making art has some reproductive advantage? Well, let's start with simpler animals. From the Darwinian point of view, beauty is among many other biological properties. In certain animals, like birds, it plays an important role in sexual selection, orienting both males and females to make the best choice of their mates. Here in nature, beauty is a symbol of youth, strength, and health. The peacock's tail is the emblematic example, but what about humans? Is our capability of appreciating beauty in nature, the display of colors of birds, the symmetry of flowers, the beauty of, of, of painted Venus, or the harmony of Beethoven symphonies, is this appreciation something inborn in our own nature, or is it simply due to our education and therefore the product of culture? During the philosopher Dennis Dutton, or according to the philosopher Dennis Dutton, 2009, an interesting in art, an interest in art belongs to the list of evolutionary adaptations, together with the enjoyment of sex, the response of, to facial expressions, the understanding of logic, and the spontaneous acquisition of language, all of which make it easier for us to survive and reproduce. He suggests that this appreciation for beauty may have been what pushed our hominoid ancestors toward the beauty, the, towards the beautiful savannas of, of Africa and other landscape that would have appealed to them. Dutton uses arguments taken from evolutionary psychology to show that human perceptions undergo a kind of evolutionary development. Darwinianism is linked to beauty by Roger Scroton in his book, Beauty, 2009. The idea is that complaint, uh, co contemplative appreciation is also instinctive, which permits the author to link high artistic values to our biology. It is perhaps interesting to recall that Immanuel Kant had already thought that our appreciation of nature is spontaneous, coming from an instinct. The aesthetic sense in humans must be considered in conjunction with the development of consciousness, as well as spirituality, the determinants discussed earlier. Perhaps the sense of wonder before the beauty of a landscape, like our own wonder in looking at the Grand Canyon or the majestic peaks of the Alps, is also one of the preliminary emotions experienced by the first hominids, one that joins the appreciation of beauty with awe before the mysteries of nature and eventually with the presence of some supernatural power. The search for beauty and harmony, which we have identified as a key characteristic of human nature, is manifest not only in works of art, but also in the persistent search for order in nature and in the cosmos. The harmony of the movements of the stars and planets become, became the foundation of astrology in ancient times, and then of the various attempts to interpret the universe often on the basis of beautiful geometrical representations. In concluding this chapter, let us note that in this discussion, we have presented the genetic determinants of being human separate from each other. This is of course valid only for the sake of simplicity. Consciousness, spirituality, artistic creativity, abstract thinking and rationality intertwine with each other in an intricate maze. In most manifestations of our actions and products of our civilization, it may be difficult to discriminate any one from the others. This reiterates the complexity of the species Homo sapiens, the species capable of creating the splendors of St. Peter's Basilica and also capable of dropping the atomic bomb. Okay, great. That was 
That was our diptych readings for tonight. So I will put in our guiding questions and see what y'all think in the chat again, just so they're there. The first one again was, why do you think chirality or the property of asymmetry is considered to be an important concept in many branches of science? And what examples of chirality can you think of in nature? Like the human hands. Turns out it's everywhere. It's, it's a really interesting concept. Um, and then the second question is, do you think human beings are genetically hardwired towards violence? And how much do you think violence and exploitation are genetically determined versus culturally conditioned? Which this question is, turns out I did a little background research is quite controversial in general. And there's lots of different opinions from the anthropological community on it. So it's kind of a meant to be provocative in that way. Um, but yeah, those those are the seeds to plant and see see if you all have any insights. I mean, I can just start us off a little with some of the, the background research I was doing, at least on, on, well, on both questions, but the second question about whether we're hardwired towards violence. And um, it's fiercely debated in the anthropological community. There's been uh, evidence, there's uh, one anthropologist found documented over 70 societies that don't make war at all. Um, the Martu of Australia, have no words for feud or warfare. Uh, the Semai of Malaysia um, actually just flee into the forest when faced with conflict. So his, his or her um, point of view was like, if there's little arc, you know, if it maybe it's not an inherent property that 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 this is something that's more culturally conditioned. But then there's been other. Um, more biologically focused anthropologists that have found evidence in uh, human genetics of having predispositions to to violence. And so it's it's not a honestly for me in my little bit of inquiry and contemplation, I, I feel that there's no one answer that it's actually a little bit of both just like the nature nurture thing, you know, like it's a little bit of both um, is, is the conclusion I come to. And like we talked about paradoxes and being able to hold contradictions together in your mind. And, you know, we have both, we have both a predisposition for altruism and love and violence. And it's like, which is interesting, you know, cause then that gives us this sense of agency around how, what we nurtured, like the two wolves in the <laughs> native story of which one you feed, you know? Um, so I, after kind of reading through some of the background research that people are doing that actually study across cultures and across many, many um, different study areas, it seems that there's evidence for both culturally conditioned forms of violence and, and maybe some predispositions towards it, as well as the opposite, altruism and love, so. I kind of struggled with the binarical opposition between love and violence and um, just like philosophically speaking, I feel like it's, a little, it's more complicated than just that. And I mean, that's not really talking about whether or not 
it's a biological determinant or something inherent to the human, but that was something that I found difficult to get past a little bit. Yeah, I actually really love that point of view because I think that when you have those um, oppositions, usually there's actually gray area in between and like a lot more complexity than just this or that, you know, it seems like life tends, tends towards that. Yeah, I think that the second reading might have been a little hasty to pin things down to a really particular interpretation of biological evidence. Like for example, the, um, the walking upright being the source of the sense of beauty. I mean, there's plenty of, uh, I, I just wasn't really able to see how that was so uniquely responsible for creating a sense of beauty when um, there's plenty of other modes of locomotion or um, life, styles that expose organisms to the same kinds of vistas or sunsets or sunrises or things like that. And I don't know, maybe just in general, um, the, the conclusions that the paper or the reading arrived at were excluding the gray area that they, they, they sort of went with a conclusion that because this could be a certain way um, that, you know, they, they sort of ran with that explanation and extrapolated it out to systems, current systems that are a, a lot more complex and dynamic than um, can be explained by tracing a simple direct descent, descent from um, our early biological evolution. I was very interested in the author bringing up the subject of violence being a male condition. It made me really wonder what uh, the potential of a nonviolent race would be like if uh, if if we were if we had the experience of being in a more matriarchal. Um, feminine led uh, societal system. I've really, I've never heard violence being uh, sort of pinpointed towards the male uh, side of our race. And, and it seemed even in the, uh, the, uh, the, the chimpanzee race, it was equally male. Um, I find it very interesting to uh, to imagine the possibility of of a, a less violent race if the female power was had more power, if the feminine had more societal power. To that point, I think um, I've read some research that bonobos are actually um a matriarchal kind of species that their leaders are um women i'm not sure if i can corroborate that now but i seem to remember i've read that somewhere or anyone else i've, I've also read that yeah. yeah you know there was this uh woman dr helen caldicott who'd done research on percentages of women in organizations in any kind of institution and the type of behavior and aggressions they had and the study showed that if there were 30 percent of women or less in these power positions they would take on all of the aggressive characteristics of the males to it, um, demonstrate power. But as soon as this critical mass was hit of 30% or more women, suddenly these more natural feminine qualities of compassion and nurturing 
came in and they didn't feel the need to uh, display power in a masculine way. It wasn't like they, they made a conscious decision. It was just literal critical mass of uh, femininity <laughs> in, a, in a situation. And it was in uh, corporate situations and in governmental situations and, and things like that. I just think one of those, one of the, in the second reading, um, it seemed to cycle through different um, characteristics like the appreciation of aesthetics or love or the capacity for violence as looking for things that distinguish what it is that makes one human. And um, in the history of thought about uh, a sort of a self-conscious human. Um, I think people have always tried to distinguish the certain characteristics of advanced thinking as being human versus a sort of a mechanical, determined biological process that happens uh, in a more, uh, let's say lizard brain um, for a colorful term uh, in, in animals. And it turns out that that's completely, in cognitive science today, that whole notion is completely blown apart, that pigs have higher thinking and base thinking, just like humans have higher thinking and base thinking. And each of these capacities, whether it's love or um, appreciation of music or sociability or even deception, which lies behind so much of uh, our belief and ideologies, um, it's, un it's almost difficult. It is actually very difficult to tease out which is the part that comes from your um, primordial brain, as it were, and which is the higher thinking part. It's as a result of our evolution through Earth history, we've just had these very stochastic developments and. Now it's almost impossible to tease out. So I think the lesson there is um, that really we're part of that continuum of animals, um, which I think was also mentioned in the reading. I'm curious about the the gender and the violence um, being tied to biology, because I think that can really easily fall into a language of um, gender is biological and traits associated with gender are biological, which feels like a projection of human constructions of gender onto other creatures. And yeah, I just, I'm curious about that. Well, like was in the first re reading, um, there's so much potential for the growth and development of systems and of ways of, you know, developing and, and I hesitate to use the word being, but um, that there's really no essential um, set of characteristics that are immutable that can be assigned on the basis of biology to, to any of the sexes. I think that those things are just as permeable, just as um, subject to developing in different directions that are not determined by um, a predictable pattern that might be re a result of our projections. And to narrow that complexity down is, omitting a lot of what the reality of what's going on is. I mean, to your point, I think, um, Izzy, a lot of it comes down to function because I think um, that the reading mentioned the, the love between a mother and 
a child, as well as the entire suite of biological material that's exchanged between the mother and the child during the birth process, during breastfeeding, that um, is a kind of bond that that actually sets up brain patterns and brain developments in the child. So that has historically, I think, been identified with female, but our understanding of what distinguishes female and male <laughs> has evolved um, in the same time period to where we can see that a range of different um, molecular level compositions can constitute what is represented as female outside. So in that sense, you know, we, we sort of gender the nurturer mother, um, but even that biological being that gave birth to a child while we call them female can have a range of characteristics. Mm, that's interesting. I didn't think about the actual bodily function of the material, which I think is makes sense. But then to gender that as something that's female, I think is where, um, like you're saying, there there's much more complex range, and that's where I kind of fall away from the from the perspective. Just to kind of jump into the conversation visually, um, I'm thinking about the diagram that Diego presented where, uh, for chirality, where you have a blue and a yellow, and thinking about the blue and the yellow as male and female, um, and this idea that there is two separate boxes that have very different colors. And then you have a third box, which is the perfect fit of those two colors on top of each other. Um, but when it was diagrammed with the wings, you saw each separate color and a kind of brown overlay, which was the not complete join, but kind of um, separate, uh, and distinct form of the um, ambiguous amalgam of the two. So I think in a way this, um, this week's learning was outlined by Ruby to give us a sense of what she calls emergence. And that is, I think there's a problem with language and the binary here. Like I think male and female are no more like accurate than blue and yellow. Those are words that represent like two different squares. Um, but I think this conversation is really about um, trying to find the language to show that there's a whole range of emergence that happens because of the coexistence of two things creating a third which is uniquely not either one and then that keeps going over time so that that thing which is now the new emergence that's not the either one of the two now will cross reference itself with another thing which is not either or but the hybridization of those things and then those things cross relate so the idea of the um, golden section is that there are some rules that generate emergence, but scale changes, but there's still some kind of adherence to a basic principle that moves us forward. I think also that the reading uses characteristics emblematically like violence or love. Uh, I, I feel like those things are used to represent states of being in the same way that colors are used to, as almost like geometric proofs of concept. They're not very subtly outlined. So I'm thinking of them more like, like kind of linguistic diagrams to um, show or perhaps 
challenge the idea that human history is connected to any linear idea of progress. So we're not progressing. <laughs> We're not progressing in these areas that are innate at the pace we think we are. We're probably progressing at a much more amorphous rate that has to do with the um, symbiotic interrelationship between the traumas we're living with um, um, and not just human traumas, the atmospheric traumas that we're living with. Um, those factors are like at play in the emergence of, of, of who and what we are. Yeah, Lauren, to your point of the, um, the brown overlay between the blue and the yellow, I think that that you could even think of as the, the, the source out of which polarized blue or yellow emerge from. And that's sort of the, the, primordial stuff that that gender or sex like precipitates out of but you know they, it always has the potential to be subsumed back into that neither or and you see I mean you see that all over the place in in organisms that have you know, like the like the the mushrooms we were talking about in an earlier um session or fish that go between male and female within a lifetime or birds in which you know the the male is the one that incubates the eggs and and sits on the nest all the time while the female is out procuring food i mean to to use very crude examples i think that those specializations come out later as a result of um the biological circumstances that organisms find them in and what they have find themselves in and what they have to adapt to like they're in. So it's all conditional. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking too, Diego. I was thinking also of, of epigenetics, like this whole idea of genetic determinism when actually our genes are actually more dynamic and in relation to the environment and experience than we previously thought, which is like the concept of epigenetics. And then on top of that, um, I'll put a link because we've been at, at the studio talking about um, another form of evolution, which is symbiogenesis put forward by Lynn Margulis, which is instead of just evolution occurring through you know, two genes coming together and you inherit something or evolution occurring through random mutation there's actually organism like bacteria like horizontal gene transfer so like it's it's much more dynamic and fluid i guess is is really my point than like this idea that we're genetically determined in any one way um i think is a oversimplification and um just like categorizing human violence and love as like immutable um, characteristics. But yeah, I'll put a, a link right now just because it's it's been so influential to me of um, a documentary about Lynn Margulis who, who first proposed symbiogenesis and really fought for it um, against a lot of like Darwinian and neo-Darwinian scientists. And now it's pretty much accepted within the com scientific community as, as a key driver to evolution. Um. Yeah, about the, the biological sex um, issue. I think I, I said this once before, or I seem to remember, but um, the notion of um, a certain biological characteristic distinguishing what is female from what is male um, has also been turned on its head over time. Um, there's no such thing as men have, you know, uh, an X and a Y chromosome and, and a woman has a, a Y and Y because they found other genes that are intermediary factors that happen sometimes in men and sometimes in what we thought was women. And then further to that, there's androgen insensit insensitivity, which is a defining characteristic. So they've kept <laughs> over time trying to define what it is that distinguishes male and female and it gets more and more complicated the more you probe. And so there is really that 
overlapping sort of gray area where um, very specifically at the genetic level, um, the notion of a woman distinguished from a man is highly variable across a population of even 300 people. Well, we're getting low on time, Jen. Did should we move into our our? Uh, this is a really great conversation, so I don't I don't want to stop it short. If anyone else has anything, because but um, just wanted to keep an eye on time if we want to move into the kind of final piece. I think now is a good time. Um, at this point of the evening, it, I'm sorry. At this point of the evening. Let's share our name and what we're working on, and then we'll popcorn it to someone else. I am now on the outer edge of, oh, hold on, I guess I have to take my video. Hold on one second, change my background. I am on the outer edge of my embroidery. So I'm really coming into the home stretch, and this is the Mycelium Network Carbon Exchange. Wow. And I, I Love that. That's really nice. Thank you so much. Wow. I was a little nervous about the green. I was a little nervous about the green. I'll admit, I just started that tonight, and I thought oh, the green I mean, is exciting. The green is like, very I'm, okay. Because I was like, maybe I need more light in my kitchen. It looks like it's a little too neon, but um, so let's see how how it looks tomorrow. But I'm on a roll, um, and so I will now pass it to Millie. Good evening, everybody. My name is Millie. I'm, I'm zooming in from Glassell Park. And tonight I am, I mended one of my favorite dresses uh, that was silk screened, I think four years, five years ago at Metabolic Studio. And so I was just fixing it up, giving it more life. And also one of my favorite t-shirts, I mean shirts, jean shirts, just mending it as well. Just giving my clothes another chance in life. Life. I love Millie that you're always mending your clothes and giving them a second life and not just going and buying more but making them you know it's crazy. yeah exactly might as well give them another life and yeah. I, I generally don't go out and buy new stuff and whatever <laughs> yeah. I have it's like I love it so yeah great memories <laughs> all right I will popcorn it to Diego Blanco and real quick, Diego, before you start, I just wanted to ask too, did anybody try the new stitch tonight? Um, you can respond in the chat while Diego introduces himself. Hi everyone, I'm Millie. Um, uh, my name is Diego Blanco. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm calling from Altadena. Um, and I was sharing the screen and going along with the readings today. So um, I wasn't doing much with my hands, but, uh, I did finish a while ago one of the drawings that I was working on during a previous um, previous session. Uh, maybe if we had more time, I could show it, but that's what I have. So um, I'll pass it to Olan. Hello, uh, calling in from West Hollywood using she, her pronouns, working on something a cell of some sort. I don't know what it is, but. Wow. Wow. Nice. Oh, so I got a new biogenesis. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I will popcorn over to D. I. Durainer calling in from Baldwin Hills, uh, go by she, her pronoun, and I am working on the yellow rumpered warbler manzanita bird and wow. I, doing some blues and yellows. Ooh, that's beautiful. <laughs> and I'm working on the letters. It's a little difficult, but I'm, I'm trying. You're doing it. <laughs> 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 I will popcorn it to Roxanne. 
Hi, I'm Roxanne, and I'm calling in from the Metabolic Studio. And um, so I can't see myself. Um, I'm working on a common raven. Can you see? Um, turn angle, turn the light just a little. Oh, better. Yeah. Beautiful. So I, I, I haven't done very much. I also was doing a little mending myself, and I was working on um, trying which um, needs a repair and I don't know how to tat so if anybody does know how to do tatting um, I would love some help <laughs> so uh, it took me a long time to figure out what the problem was which I figured out the problem and I have no idea how to fix it and I will pass it on to Caroline <laughs> Good evening, uh, Caroline, calling from Studio City, using she, her pronouns. I have been mending too tonight. <laughs> <laughs> A very old gown from India that I love. And uh, just, just patiently wow. saving. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Beauty. Um, <laughs> And uh, thank you for beautiful, beautiful evening. I'll pass it to Walker. Uh, I'm Walker and I'm zooming in from uh, Baja, California, and I use she, her pronouns. And I left my embroidery somewhere, so I had to start another one today. And I kind of cheated because I found this um, embroidery already in a thrift store. But then I started to just make a blobby thing on it. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but there you go. Nice. Beautiful. Haley, how about you? Hi, I'm Lee Adams, uh, she, her pronouns. I'm in Altadena, and I am mosaicing stepping stones that um, are a little bit too heavy to hold <laughs> up into the computer. Uh, but I'm enjoying listening and thinking and remembering five years of working with the orangutan at the LA Zoo and their human behaviors. Um, Let's see. Ansu, how about you? Hi, my name is Ansu. I'm calling in from Silver Lake. I go by she, her pronouns, as far as I know. I haven't done a molecular analysis, <laughs> but here's my, uh, I don't, is this soil microbiology? Ooh. I think it is. It looks like there's a nematode I have to get to, but <laughs> kind of protest something. There is, there is an, a nematode in there as well. <laughs> so I have to pass it to Emily, did you go yet? Yes. Thanks, Ansu. No, I haven't gone oh. yet. Uh, hi, everyone. Emily calling in here from Echo Park. She, her pronouns. Happy to be with you all, and uh, I was pretty much listening tonight and just uh, listening to the words, and I enjoyed reading as well. So thanks for having me. Let and me... for becoming one with your garden. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just feels right tonight. What can I say? It's the corn, uh, corn uh, harvest last summer. Uh, with metabolics, that's what the image is. Uh, how do you do that where it's just your face? <laughs> it's just a strange digital glitch. I yeah. think. It's a computer confusion extravaganza. <laughs> um, let me pass it to Kavi. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, Kavi, I go by, or I use he, her, he, him pronouns. Um, 
basins or calling in from Sacramento and still working on their hermit thrush, uh, feeling more confident with my stitches uh, and chugging along. I'm feeling like I need to go back and redo some some uh, of the leaves that I started with in the beginning as I'm learning more through the sessions and uh, uh, Jen, thanks for all the amazing videos to kind of get inspiration and ideas and learning more. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying it so far. Um, I will pass it over to... Uh, Actually, Kavi, I think we're yeah. getting a little low on okay. time, so we'll we'll wrap up here. And I was going to pass it over quickly. Diego, you had something to share before we sign off tonight? Yeah, well, I had some of the, uh, the current events that we had collected. Um, and I guess I can just go through them briefly. It's totally, uh, well, not totally, but it's it's a pretty big shift from what we were talking about. Um, and it just has to do with some of, of the ecological happenings that are a result of our Anthropocene condition here and now. So I don't know, it seems like we should we should talk about it. So I can go through them. I have three of them. Um, maybe we'll be able to get through some of them, but here. So the first one is this one here, which is a study about um, these animals called rotifers, which uh, were found preserved in um, permafrost, and they had survived 24,000 years inside the permafrost. Um, and this article, uh, I can put the, the links to these in the chat if you want to go through and read them. It might take too much time to scroll through the whole thing now, but um, basically what the article is saying is that um, not only are these rotifers uh, were they able to survive 24,000 years of being frozen in permafrost, but um, whole ecosystems, whole ancient ecosystems of microbes are preserved in these permafrost um, deposits. And they're all viable when, they, when they're revived and they come out and um, they're defrosted. So not only do we have specific like individual organisms that are from such a long time ago that are now thrown back into the mix and interacting with um, communities and ecosystems and starting to change things, but whole communities which um, are coming out of the past. And I think that's, that's pretty interesting and has a lot, to, a lot of food for thought for um, how the current ecological systems could be affected by this. Um, the second one is this article about how uh, Los Angeles was designated as a certified wildlife habitat. Um, this one goes into some detail about what that means. Um, this process of getting areas certified as wildlife habitat depends on um, having a, a few requirements like uh, water cover, native plants, um, and uh, basically you can have anything from a garden to a park certified as this kind of wildlife habitat. And um, with the certification of 1,200 of these sites in LA that qualified the city to be certified through the same program um, as a wildlife habitat. And, you know, while Los Angeles has always been a wildlife habitat and this designation doesn't suddenly make it into one as if it had not been before, um, the use of it is that it's, uh, the, the people who did it um, are really encouraging everyone to use things like um, iNaturalist or eBird, which are citizen science websites uh, that allow you to submit observations of animals um, and plants and everything in between. And uh, this is part of a larger effort to map biodiversity and understand how biodiversity in an urban ecology is responding to um, things like pollution, habitat loss, climate change, and again, everything in between. So. That's that. And the final one um, is this study that found that uh, the Eastern Amazon, where there's been really heavy deforestation and um, uh, dry conditions leading to fire, um, is now emitting more carbon than it's taking up um, through the forest. And this is something that scientists had been predicting for a really long time. They had been getting inklings through isolated chunks of data that this was happening and that the system was tipping towards this, um, this state. But uh, this study was able to collect um, a, a much wider like set of data that 
not only corroborated the first sets of findings, but also um, added more information onto them. And um, they found that in contrast to the Eastern Amazon, the Western Amazon is still um, getting heavy rainfall. It's not as threatened by um, ranching and deforestation. And so it's, it's still um, a carbon sink as opposed to a carbon source. Um, I thought this was especially relevant that some of the systems even like the mighty Amazon that we might take for granted um, are becoming changed, becoming something else um, in this new time that we live in. Uh, and we all have to find ourselves in the new systems and the new loops of relationships that they open up, which we don't have a precedent for. So there's your dose of <laughs> current ecological events. I mean, some hopeful, some not so much, but, and some just food for thought. Thank you, Diego. And thank you to the um, Metabolic Studio um, uh, WhatsApp thread where we've been um, trying to share uh, current events that are connected to the micro and macro subjects of this learning and mending unit so that while we're reading about these ideas, we're also kind of attuning ourselves to look at current events outside of the event, uh, outside of the idea that something's happening over there. Because obviously, if, um, if the atmosphere is part of our commons, then the destruction of the Amazon is not something that happens somewhere else. It happens to all, all of us, all, all living creatures. So um, we're trying to, uh, bring closure to these evenings with a little bit of grounding in the um, current events of some of these ideas. And if any of you have anything that you want to add into our current event hopper, um, please, please do. Um, we're happy to receive it at our info at metabolicstudio.org site and we'll add it into our current event um, discussion. So Kelly, what's next? Okay, well, thanks for everything tonight. It was a really good conversations tonight. Um, next week, okay, so next week we have perception and focus. We're gonna investigate a little deeper into cognition and consciousness and the study of symbolism, language and communication. So please join us and thank you everybody and hope to see you next time. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Good night. Bye. 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 See you next time. Look at that cutie, Twitter <laughs> and Lulu in the same Zoom page. Oh, oh double, my God. Double love. And there's, oh my God, is that Bucky too? Everybody's there. <laughs> Critter. Critter, got, Critter got kicked in the eye by our little filly today, but oh. she seems fine. Oh. Poor critter. Was her own undoing. You know, she's a healer, so she's constantly yeah. at their heels. And yeah. today she got a little too close. I'm glad she but she's good. Away. Yeah. Yeah. Were those those beautiful horses you put on social me media, the white one and the tan one? Oh, you know, those are wild horses that live on the land here. Uh, There's uh, uh, now 12 of them. And the mares are all pregnant again. But the stallion of that wild herd is the father of my, my um, filly, yeah. Oh my God, so beautiful. That picture was just astounding. You know, those horses are, we're, we're actually starting a little sanctuary for them mm -hmm. um, and inviting people to come and hike up into the mountains and just hang out with them. Um, 
and I'm they coming. are so remarkable. I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Calm down. You should. Lauren just shows up at 8 a.m. I'm coming right now. Do you have a Tesla it, it's charger only, there? <laughs> it's, only, it's only three and a half hours away. It's, I'm totally so coming, I'm totally coming to visit you, Walker. I'll, I'll be there. Yeah, I'll you, be there. At, let's see. 10 <laughs> right on i would love i would love to have your company all right you got it yeah. I'm on my way all right. all right just let me know if you need any directions you might find it on your own i, I just type in walker's sanctuary for wild horses and i'll get there right Actually, if you just actually, if you type in Encino Solo, it's, okay. it pops up in Google and you All can right. see where it is. Well, if I don't get there tonight, I'm coming very soon. <laughs> Excellent. I'm just worried I'm going to come back with a horse in my back. You may. You little, may. One of those little babies. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're pretty... Um, just sitting with them if you go up to the mountains and sit quietly they'll just come up to you and touch you and breathe you and lick you and it's really quite a lovely experience so i'd be happy to share that with anyone really your, come on down. your, your picture of your garment and your backyard it, it's just mm. your 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 eye candy yes <laughs> ah. <laughs> I have lots of time on my hands. I'm I'm just walking around the ranch taking pictures all day. No. Oh well, well, it's a dirty job. Someone's got to do it. True. All right. See you later. All right. Have a good night. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.